Welcome to those just tuning in. Our next panel tackles the topic of culinary medicine. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Ayers, Representative Jim McGovern, Tasha, Annette. That was a wonderful discussion on food as medicine uh, and, uh, and policy, and we, we really appreciate that. We're pleased to have you back. We're going to be talking about culinary medicine um, and, and the impact it has uh, on, on, our, on, our, on our disease state. Um, we have some incredible guests with us today, Chris, Christina Badaraco. I, I just destroyed that, Dr. David Eisenberg and Dr. Michael Fenster. Christina, correct me, how did I say, say, it, say your last name for me? Badaraco. Badaraco, so easy and I, and I messed it up. Um, I wanted to start you know, right off the bat and, and talk about um, culinary medicine and what the definition is. We hear that term bantered around a lot. I'm starting to see it heavily in, in, in research studies. We do a news and research digest every week. And I'm starting to see that term come up so often um, in, in the space of food as medicine. Um, why don't we start with, with you, Dr. Eisenberg. Can you tell us what the definition of culinary medicine is and what we should know about it? You know, I, I don't know the exact definition. There are a few, but I think it, it generally looks at the combination of culinary skills, cooking, and medicine. How do you apply the features of teaching people to cook and bring them to a healthcare system to combine them into something that helps patients make better choices, treat their illnesses, prevent their illnesses, reverse their illnesses. I think that's the general sense of culinary medicine. Chrissy, do you happen to know, or Mike, do you know the exact definition? Well, I don't, I don't think there is one. I think there's as many definitions of culinary medicine as there are like known as recipes for meatballs. So uh, I think it depends. Uh, certainly, you know, at the, at the University of Montana, uh, we have a, a strict definition uh, that we have to apply. And it's a little bit different in that uh, our definition of culinary medicine involves looking at food through the lens of information theory and then applying that to a food health equation to maximize an individual's, uh, uh, in a positive way, their food relationships. So our viewpoint and our perspective is a little bit different than I think what a lot of people have been talking about earlier, we're looking at food as medicine and using it as a medical therapeutic intervention. So our definition and, and what we encompass and what we teach as, col and as culinary medicine is a little bit uh, broader and more interconnected. And uh, Christina? Um, I appreciate the perspective we just heard. I think the definition that I've often heard and used is similar to what we heard from Dr. Eisenberg, the definition from La Puma back, I think, in 2008 about 
uh, the blending of the art of cooking with the science of medicine. So when I've looked at when I've looked at certain curriculum that have you know talked about you know culinary medicine, it's not exactly what I'm hearing right now. I, I've seen you know it looking to me more like nutrition education, um, and I and and I, and I just think that they're entirely different things. Am I am I right or wrong about that? Am I am I missing something? Um, well, David. I, I would say, you know, again, from our perspective and looking and, anal and analyzing, you know, biological systems, uh, which lend themselves to an uh, analogous um, information system analyses that, uh, you know, nutrition is one communication pathway. That is uh, one way that food delivers information which again becomes part of a food experience and builds an individual's food relationship. Uh, for our study of culinary medicine, there are many other channels uh, through which important information that impacts health uh, are delivered. So who we eat the food with, when we eat the food, where we eat the food, things that we can measure, things that, that we can't measure, all of these uh, end up impacting uh, the, the health uh, equation. So uh, for us, nutrition is very important, but it's one of many communication channels by which food and that food experience delivers information to our bodies, which impact our overall health. And, and if we're talking, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Uh, I, I was going to suggest that we go back a couple steps because you're talking about the distinction between nutrition education and culinary medicine. <clears throat> uh, I would argue that Nutrition education is the bigger tent, and culinary medicine is a part of it. Uh, again, to give you some historical perspective, <clears throat> you know, at the risk of oversharing, I come from several genera generations of professional bakers and cooks, but I went to medical school. So I'm a product of the two communities, and when I went to medical school in the dark ages of the 70s, no one knew anything about nutrition and even the people who knew something about nutrition knew very little if anything about food or cooking so you know 40 50 years ago it was a gaping hole in medical education to talk about either nutrition or cooking i think if you fast forward 40 years People are realizing, number one, we do have nutrition science now, although it's rarely taught in medical school. And I think increasingly in dozens of medical schools across the country, and hopefully Mike and Chrissy will back me up here, medical students, residents, practicing docs are learning about nutrition and culinary medicine in an effort to teach them about nutrition and how to advise patients. So whether they're taking medical students on a tour of a grocery or bringing them into a makeshift uh, conference room that's turned into a kitchen for a group medical visit, or they're going into an actual kitchen, large or small, brick and mortar or virtual. They're learning about food and how to advise patients about food. And the last thing I'll say is I think increasingly people are sharing of the opinion that teaching health professionals or patients about nutrition and food in the absence of a teaching kitchen is like teaching kids and adults the value of swimming in the absence of a swimming pool. How do you do that? So there has to be a practical experiential component. That's where culinary medicine comes in. That's great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right back to you because um, and I've been looking at this for, for quite some time. So, so a teaching kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I, I would ask you, is a teaching kitchen, is something, is that something that you, you you're putting in a, a hospital is that, um, that patients are going to learn from physician chefs, like, 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 uh, like chef, Dr. Mike, or are they, uh, or, and from, from dietitians and from chefs, or is that something where medical school students are these teaching kitchens or medical schools and medical school students are going into these kitchens after they've had their basic nutrition education courses and now learning how to apply that so that they could teach patients and understand when they're giving patients advice 
that, hey, you know, when you, you, you need to cook it and it needs to be cooked this way and this is how you, and, and when, I, when I tell you you should be adding more broccoli, by the way, make sure you use this because I've done it before. Tell, tell, because, and all three of you should jump in here. So we'll start with you, Dr. Eisenberg. Well, to me, a teaching kitchen is more than a kitchen. You know, I view it as a learning lab, a classroom for life skills. I think the kitchen part of it is the attractive piece. It's the neon light. People increasingly want to learn how to cook because they've lost that skill. And three generations of people out working and grandparents not living in the home, people are fascinated. So if you say, come in the kitchen, we'll teach you how to cook. But it's also a place to learn nutrition facts. Which foods should we be eating and cooking? How to cook them? How to shop for them? How to read labels? In my view and the view of members of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative that I helped create, people also say, if you've got them in the kitchen, you're teaching them nutrition and cooking, teach them about the importance of movement and exercise, of rest and sleep. Teach them how their food choices impact the environment and sustainability of the planet. Teach them to eat and cook and live mindfully. Because if they're not mindful in their cooking and shopping and eating, they're lost. And lastly, there's 50 years of psychology literature that I didn't learn in medical school, but motivational interviewing is now a thing in medical schools. And if we teach people to focus on what motivates them to change, it helps them change once they learn new skills. That's a teaching kitchen. And it can either be brick and mortar and expensive, or it can be two $8 tripods with an iPhone on the hands and pans and the face of the chef educator and people on a Zoom call, or it can be a $5 million teaching kitchen. So it's all of those things. And maybe the bottom line point here is a teaching kitchen is more than a kitchen and culinary medicine is a part of a teaching kitchen, but they're not the same things. That's great explanation. And, and Christina, Mike, anything to add to that? Sure. Well, I think one other aspect um, to add to the detailed description we just heard um, that I particularly love about teaching kitchens is the way they create uh, and build community um, among patients and participants, um, bringing people together to enjoy learning and cooking together and creating some of the social norms around um, healthy eating and enjoyment of healthy food that uh, we know is, is so often hard to come by. There's often a, sort of a negative perception about um, healthy food and cooking can be a barrier, um, almost like a punishment. So I think by sort of building community and creating space for that, um, teaching kitchens can really help to make uh, cooking and healthy cooking a more enjoyable experience um, and again create some of those uh, social norms and and maybe another area too is helping to break down some barriers between the patients or participants and their healthcare providers um, dispelling with some of the white coat syndrome or even hesitancy uh, you know I'll speak for myself as a, as a dietitian I think there is sometimes still hesitancy about being necessarily um, truthful about what patients are eating and um, maybe accurately portraying the sorts of things that they do eat. But I, I think people can um, bring down some of those barriers and be a lot more comfortable in a teaching kitchen setting. Christina, when you were talking, I had this vision of, of, of a new version of a, of a examination room where uh, there's actually like a, it's in a kitchen. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, after they talk to their patient, they examine them, then they sort of do like a little recipe, uh, a shared recipe, uh, with, with them. um, uh, you know, again, my imagination was running, running wild, but. Well, we yeah. might have a chance to talk a little about the shared medical appointment format, but there is kind of an option for what you just described. Um, go ahead, Chef Dr. Mike. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, number one, I take this opportunity to thank David. I don't know if everyone realizes the uh, phenomenal work uh, he's done in bringing this whole concept, you know, to fruition and reality. So, uh, so a, a, a quick uh, thanks to you, David, uh, and, not, and a bit of an acknowledgement. And I, I want to highlight on two of the things that uh, both David and, and Christina mentioned, which was the experience. And that's one of the important differences when we look at food and applying food as medicine or food in a, with a healthcare direction is the fact that it's unlike 
you know, taking a pill or getting your bone set and fixed or getting a, a pacemaker and coming in for that procedure. It's an experiential, uh, and I think David was the one who used that word, uh, part of our lives, which is very, very important and introduces a whole set of you know, variables, opportunities, and challenges that are different from how we normally approach, you know, treating disease and even chronic disease, you know, in the confines of uh, Western medicine. So I think, you know, D David's description and, and Christina's description of the teaching kitchen is uh, spot on. And, and I think it, it really is sort of a segue to uh, you know, a, a future environment where we can really impact lifestyle type things. And, and I think that that's, uh, that's very important as we discuss the impact, um, you know, both personal and economic in terms of chronic disease and, and the epidemics we face. That, that was great. And then I think, you know, one of the things that um, uh, we, we, have been, we have been talking about is how there could be future career paths um, in, in both cooking and medicine combined. Right, people that are experts in in doing that, and, and and it doesn't have to be just docs. It could be, you know, it could be registered dietitians. It could be nurses, and they could, right? I mean, is that is that kind of how you were, you guys are all envisioning this? Or, or let, let me you? jump in here. The, yeah, <clears throat> the educational ensemble of a teaching kitchen can be one person or six people, and it depends on how many. Do they know about nutrition? Can they teach people to cook? Can they teach people to be motivated to move more? Can they teach people to be mindful? And they, can they teach them to change their behaviors? But if you have an MD chef or an RD chef or a PhD in behavior who's a chef, they can do most of that themselves. So it, we have lots of examples, Chrissy and Mike and I, Mike's an example of a dual trained expert. Chrissy is also a very expert in multiple aspects of that ensemble. But in a teaching kitchen, people are there to learn how do I eat and cook and move and think differently. And to their point, when you have a team that's teaching them and it's fun, it's addictive. People just have a blast, whether they're medical students, patients, continuing ed graduate groups that are coming there to learn as we do in Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, a course for doctors every year, or the ultimate place for these things is actually schools to bring back Home Ec 2.0. Could you imagine if there were teaching kitchens in every K through six and K through 12 school, along with every college campus, along with every work site? That's kind of the vision the aspirational vision that people will come together to cook to learn a different relationship to food and have fun. So I know I'm speaking in aspirational tones here, but the teaching kitchen can be applied to all of those spaces. The facts are the same. It's just how do you package it for different population? That's why I think it's a big idea. And, and that's and I, and I and I and I agree and and, and they should be and they, they should have maybe not call home and ec, home and ex but home economics but certainly you know learning cooking and, and and lifestyle skills would be incredible but shifting and not really shifting but segueing to medical school students and medical education um, I know that um, uh, the congressman had talked about some of this previously. Um, and, and Dr. Eisenberg, you had some thoughts about uh, the impact of, of, of some of the legislation on medical um, teaching and so forth. Can you talk about that? Yeah, let me speak to that for a second. I think 30 years from now, if teaching kitchens have the impact that I think they're destined to have, Jim McGovern will go down as the pivotal figure that changed everything. And I say that because he single-handedly advocated for and then passed a bipartisan resolution in the House of Representatives that says either the medical establishment mandates, requires physicians and medical trainees to learn about nutrition and how to advise patients about food, or Congress reserves the right to withhold now $16 billion a year 
in educational funds for residents and fellows in hospitals. Wow. So it's what does an that existential threat? But what does that translate to? Or what, so what's happening as a result of that? Sorry. So what's happening as a result of that? Hold on a second. I can't. I can't hear you for a second. Go ahead, okay. Charles. So you hear my hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I said, what what's what's the result? What is happening as a result of that in medical? So there, there was there was a nutrition education summit hosted by the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education and the American Association of Medical Colleges last March. Because, you know, this is the funding that they use to train the next generation of docs. And what came out of that is an ongoing project that I'm a part of with the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative and the Accreditation Council. Instead of looking at all the existing curricula and all the teaching kitchen programs in the country, the idea was let's create a consensus of competencies. What competencies do we want every doctor to have and demonstrate moving forward? So we're in the midst of determining a consensus on the competencies. That series of surveys has been done. I think there will be an article submitted next year for publication. But can you imagine if we get to the point where medical schools and residencies agree that these are the competencies and then the curricula follow the competencies and nobody is fighting about my curriculum is better. But we're all in line, we're all rowing together saying, okay, from now on, medical students need to be able to do this. Residents in these specialties need to do this. And practicing docs need to update their skills in nutrition and advising patients about food this way. That's the future. But that was all Jim McGovern. Wow. And when that happens, then doctors are part of the solution, not the resistance. It's a huge change. So, so now we're, we're going to see more people like, you know, like, like Chef Dr. Mike and more dietitians like, like Arsina that are out there and, and sort of focusing on this as, as, a, as a solution to healthcare. Is that in, in- I think so. And that, yeah. was, that was Representative McGovern's ambition to push the medical establishment because I was in the room when he learned that doctors are not required these days to know very much about nutrition and even less about competencies in talking to patients about food. And he said, we have to change that. So that's why I think, again, in retrospect, a decade from now, he'll go down as the champion. Wow. And, and, and Mike, what does it look like in a practice? Okay. You, you, you're a cardiologist by training and also a chef by training. So the two are, you know, right